that's kind of crazy. Good evening. Good evening and welcome all to this April 9th uh, City Council public forum and meeting. We're all happy to be back after a spring break. And uh, it looks like we have 42 people to speak. So let me begin with a little formal explanation of the public forum. The public forum is an opportunity for individuals to speak to the city council on any city related issues except for those items which have already been heard by a hearings official or are on tonight's agenda as a public hearing. Each person will have three minutes to speak. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residents, your ward if known. The timer and lights indicate the time you have to speak. The red light indicates the end of three minutes. So. I will say 42 is kind of pushing the boundaries of our, um, you know, endurance, and so I uh, we have a we have a, a a waiting chair. So when you're the second person to speak, please position yourself in that chair so that the process goes um, expeditiously. And if you don't need to use your three minutes, please um, be brief, because that will just help everyone get a chance to speak before the last speakers are totally wilting from fatigue. And, um, and with that, we will begin. Uh, the first speaker is Joel Iboa. Oh, and the second speaker is Bonnie Souza. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joel Ibois, uh, Ward 7 in Claire Surrett, and I'm here representing um, the Human Rights Commissioner, Human Rights Commission as Vice Chair. Um, you have a couple decisions before you this week, as I'm aware. Um, but first of all, I'd like to just say that it's really valuable to have people of color represented in public spaces here in Eugene. Um, as a first generation American who was born and raised in Eugene and the child of immigrants, one of the few places that I had growing up to participate in public life was in our parks. Going to the BMX track, going along the Willamette River, I spent most of my childhood in those places. So the fact that council is considering naming two of our parks over not only uh, the late Andre Ortiz, but also Dr. Ed Coleman as um, a symbol of pride for me. Uh, and the Human Rights Commission heard from several community members um, at our last session about the name placing, and we fully endorse and hope the City of Eugene will take steps in the right direction to do so as well. And finally, I just wanted to let you um, aware and also mention um, my support uh, personally for um, increasing level of protection of our sanctuary cities. Um, and also to mention to you that um, I've been having conversations with Councillor Semple and Councillor Evans about the, the next logical step in sanctuary status, which is legal representation and defense from deportation. Um, Portland is currently having these conversations, um, and the Human Rights Commission will be speaking about this at our next session, um, and I will be sending all of you a policy brief about that concept tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Ani Sousa, followed by Eve Hamid. Good evening. My name is Bonnie Sousa, and I live in Betty Taylor's ward. I also serve on the Human Rights Commission, and tonight I'm speaking in behalf of the commission. Uh, given the limited time for public comment, I will present the first half of my comments, and Commissioner Ibrahim Hamede will, uh, has agreed to present the second half. Um, I'd like to first thank you for your unanimous support last March in passing an ordinance for the protection of individuals, primarily pertaining to immigrants. I'd also like to request that the mayor and city council please address the unfinished business that was left over from approving the ordinance last year and move forward in amending that law to provide additional protections for marginalized groups in Eugene, including people of color, religious minorities, immigrants, LGBTQ, gender non-conforming, unhoused, and disabled community members. A community draft of that additional language has been distributed to you, and community member David Fidanke will provide some details in his public comment tonight. Briefly, I'd like to remind you and others who are here tonight of the history of this ordinance. 
On Tuesday following the November 2016 election, Eugene community members flooded into the Human Rights Commission's regular meeting, filling the room and overflowing outside the door. Many provided emotional public comment that night about their concerns for immigrants and others expected to be targeted by the incoming administration. <clears throat> Person after person asked what the city could do to protect their students, their neighbors, their friends, family members, and themselves from an incoming administration that was clearly hostile to large segments of the population. After that meeting, a subcommittee of human rights commissioners <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and community members came together and drafted language for an ordinance. The HRC then held a special meeting in early December, inviting the public to discuss the draft ordinance. Approximately 150 people attended that meeting. We incorporate, incorporated their requests for protections into our draft language. I'm going to let Ib um, finish my. Thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Hamida, and I also live in Betty Taylor's ward. I also serve on the Human Rights Commission, and I'm here to complete Bonnie's comments. Uh, the community's draft ordinance was presented to the mayor and city council a week later than Mayor Kitty Piercy formally appointed an ad hoc committee to develop proposed outcomes for an ordinance. I was part of that ad, ad hoc committee, as was Mayor Venice, Commissioner Bonnie Souza, Ken Nubeck, and community members Phil Carrasco and David Fedanke. Unfortunately, the serious concerns expressed by communities who are already marginalized are not unfounded. They are being targeted on a regular basis, both in federal policy and through inflammatory rhetoric. The DACA program has been eliminated, threatening dreamers with deportation. ICE is stalking local courthouses detaining citizens as well as non-citizens who have violated no laws. The haphazard federal targeting of our immigrant neighbors is designed to create fear and is literally tearing families apart. The President's Muslim travel ban and the undermining and defunding of civil rights enforcement has emboldened the most extreme and violent white supremacist elements in our society. All of this gives reason to people's fears, including the question of which group will be directly targeted next by federal government or by extremists. The Eugene Human Rights Commission respectfully calls on you to complete the job you started last March when you unanimously passed the ordinance to protect individuals. Please direct the city manager to move forward with the research necessary to bring additional ordinance amendments to you for public hearing and for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dave Fedanke, followed by John Van Lanningham. Thank you. I'm David Fedanke, res longtime resident of Ward 3. Um, I uh, sent by email a, some background about this proposal to all of you last Friday afternoon, along with copies of the ordinance that you approved a year ago in March and the community proposal for additional amendments. Uh, I'm not going to read that email. I just want to hit a few highlights from it, um, both for you and for the benefit of people who are here this evening. Um, in addition to the elimination of DACA and Congress's appearing unwillingness to consider uh, moving on immigration reform, um, even the the very reasonable bipartisan proposal uh, in the Senate. Uh, the President's latest Muslim travel ban is set for oral arguments in the U.S. Supreme Court later this month. Uh, and the constitutionality and legality of that order will be um, decided by the end of June this year. Um, another thing that's happening right here in Oregon um, the ordinance you approved last year essentially incorporated into Eugene ordinance uh, the limitations on law enforcement 
for enforcement of civil immigration violations that are currently in state law. There is a proposed initiative currently being circulated, which may well qualify for the November ballot, that would repeal that state law. Uh, so once again, I want to thank you for looking ahead and incorporating the provisions of that law in Eugene Ordinance, just in case that uh, that initiative campaign is successful. But what you also did was to expand the reach of that law beyond the Eugene Police Department to cover all city staff. Uh, the second part of the ordinance um, has to do with the collection of information and maintenance of information that is also limited under state law currently um, related to political, religious, or social views of any individual or group or association unless there is information leading to the belief that there is a criminal violation. Um, again, that law applies to law enforcement. Your ordinance incorporated that into the city ordinance and also expanded part of it to um, all city departments as it relates to individuals. We think there was a piece that was left out inadvertently by the city attorney in drafting that ordinance um, that needs to be added and other provisions also need to be studied and added. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. John Van Lanningham, followed by Francisca Johnson. Thank you, Mayor and Councilors. John Van Lanningham, I'm a resident of Ward 7. I'm going to talk about housing, not surprisingly. Affordable housing is what I call it. I know Councilor Taylor wants me to call it subsidized housing, but I'm too old to change my ways. And I'm not going to talk about civil rights, so a little bit of a break. Um, I work as a lawyer for the Oregon Law Center. Uh, and have for 40 years. I strongly, I've been a member of the Housing Policy Board since 1991. I strongly support the Housing Policy Board's uh, CET, uh, Construction Excise Tax Proposal that you discussed earlier. I'm going to make a couple of notes. Um, affordable housing developers develop under the same development code that the private sector does. They have the same frustrations that the private sector does. They share the desire to make the code better. That's great. I also want to note, though, that since the legislature authorized local CETs, effective June 2, 2016, eight other cities have adopted a CET for housing. Eight. They include Newport, Hood River, and Medford. None of those cities are known as crack tax crazy, anti-business, left-wing bastions. I sat with the other affordable housing advocates watching your discussion earlier. All of us were deeply disappointed in what we see as talk and no action. We are deeply fearful that we are going to do a long process and there will be no resources for affordable housing. Thank you. I hope I'm wrong. Thank you. Francis Francisca Johnson followed by Max Getzert. Needs to get shorter. Uh, my name is Francisca Leva Johnson and I'm in um, Council Pointers district or area. Um, for many years I worked for the city of Eugene and I was a Venetian. Uh, I'm now in Eugene. And I'm here on something very personal um, and something that um, was addressed just a little while ago with regard to um, sharing the diversity and the changing demographics that we have in Eugene. Um, we all had a very good friend, many of us here, by the name of Andrew Ortiz, who sat up there with you for many years. And uh, she passed away. And um, it's still not easy to talk about because it was totally unexpected. Um, she had so much to give to us. She had, she was an amazing person. And I'm here to advocate for the naming of a park for her. Um, you've all received community support. I know that we sent a letter asking you to put this on the on the agenda or on your discussions of this uh, naming of new parks or uh, we gave you the short list and it's up to you to decide. But um, it would be very appropriate um, to give her um, a, a park, particularly in the area where she was so deeply involved in and that was with kids. 
as you know, she served on the school board. That's how I got to know her many years ago. Um, and um, Dr. Coleman um, is another elder and a very respected educator uh, in our community who also um, we lost without any warning either. Um, and it would be very, I don't know if it's the worst nice, but it would be very appropriate to recognize your community of color leaders that you've had. Thank you. Thank you. Max Gessert, followed by Asida <laughs> Collier. Um, thank you for, for your support for the ordinance concerning the rights of individuals. I think of it as the so-called sanctuary ordinance, and I know we're not supposed to use that word, at least um, in the writing of it. I hope very much for our community that we will not experience mass arrests of undocumented immigrants or federally sanctioned persecution of any minority. However, we would be very naive to assume that such things cannot happen here. Um, it's not just a matter of Oregon's history, but the current federal ad administration has made its values very clear. So we need to prepare, and some of that preparation has already been done with the um, ordinance concerning the rights of individuals, but it needs to be completed. All of the groups that the city has recognized in connection with the ordinance deserve protection. But I want to put in a few words for gay people. My daughter's gay. She was raised in Eugene, but now lives in San Francisco. When she visits, I want her and her partner to enjoy the same sense of protection that they have when they are in San Francisco. Sometimes my daughter talks about moving back to Eugene, and I very much hope that she will. However, even if she does not, I want her and her partner to know that this community, the one in which she was raised and where her parents still live, does what it can to be fair to the people who live here and to offer what protections it can when there is a real threat of persecution, as there is today. So please move ahead with the ordinance, and please finish up the outstanding portions as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Zeta Collier, followed by Chris Wig. Good evening. My name is Seda Collier. I'm a member, or I live in, in Betty Taylor's ward. Um, I'm a member of a nonprofit called Transponder. We serve the, the transgender community here in town and in the area. Um, in the interest of disclosure, I'm also an uh, employee of the city of Eugene, although tonight I'm speaking solely as a private citizen, resident, and um, uh, vice president of, of Transponder. And um, in the trans community, we, a lot of my, my people uh, live in fear and of, of having their identity disclosed. Um, it includes people from all different um, areas of life, including DACA members, immigrants, and so on. Um, and so because of this, I want to encourage you to complete the work on the, uh, the Safe Cities, what I'm going to call the Safe Cities Ordinance and move forward with that as quickly as possible and, and make it as, as complete as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chris Wig, followed by Kate Gessert. Hello, my name's Chris Wig. I live in downtown Eugene in Ward 1. I serve on the Housing Policy Board with Councillor Pryor, and for the last three and a half years, I've served as the chair of your Democratic Party. And I'm here tonight to provide comment on the implementation of Senate Bill 1051 regarding secondary dwelling units. Uh, some background for the group that Senate Bill 1051 was a top priority of the Democratic Caucus in both the Oregon Senate and the Oregon House. The bill aims to provide one tool to address the housing crisis by allowing uh, and requiring local governments to lower barriers to building secondary dwelling units within their jurisdiction. The intent of the legislature was to allow SDUs to be built anywhere where there is a single family home. And that Representative Fahey is here tonight, so I'm not going to wax poetic on the intent of the legislature. But I do believe that the two-phase process that's currently under consideration may or may not meet the letter of the law, and it certainly violates its spirit. 
The Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development published implementation guidelines in March 2018. I emailed those to all of you earlier today if you haven't seen them, and I just wanted to read a few of them into the record. Under citing standards, it stipulates, DLCD says, that local governments should not mandate minimum lot sizes for ADUs so that lot coverage requirements do not preclude ADUs from being built on smaller lots. Local governments should review their lot coverage standards to make sure they don't create a barrier to development. For design standards, any design standards required of ADUs must be clear and objective according to the Oregon revised statutes. Clear and objective standards do not contain words like compatible or character. Under parking, requiring off-street parking is one of the biggest barriers to developing ADUs and it's recommended that jurisdictions not include an off-street parking requirement in their ADU standards. Owner occupancy requirements in which the property owner is required to live on the property in either the primary or accessory dwelling unit are difficult to enforce and are not recommended. And system development charges are not a part of 1051, but um, the DLCD recommends that local governments should consider revising their system development charges to match the true impact of ADUs in order to remove barriers to their development. And so I think that in light of this material, the intent of the legislature is clear. I think the right thing to do is also clear that we need to support our renters. We need to support building more housing units that are more affordable in the city of Eugene. And I would ask you to move forward with all of the proposals under phase one and two right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kate Gessert, followed by David Piccioni. Hi. My name is Kate Gessert, and I live on the outskirts of Eugene. Um, I'm a member of Friends of Sanctuary, and I thank you for, for voting unanimously last year for the ordinance protecting the rights of individuals. Um, I also ask you please to add the following to the Eugene City Ordinance concerning the rights of individuals. No city personnel, law enforcement, or others will collect or maintain individually identifiable information about the immigration status of any individual, the race, ethnicity, national origin, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, housing status, or disability of any individual. And we understand, we, the different people that have been talking about this, that before the city council can vote, city departments will have to be surveyed about some of the vulnerable groups that would be added to the ordinance, um, and it might take several months to do this. In the interim, we ask, please, that John Ruiz, as the, Ruiz, as the city manager, that he would um, please issue an administrative order to temporarily protect immigrants from having information about their immigration status collected or maintained until the city council can vote and add protection, permanent protection for all the groups, including immigrants. I think with some of the things that we've seen happening in the news, it's really important as this process goes forward that there be this temporary protection um, for collecting information about immigration status. Um, I've had the honor of working with um, immigrants as an ESL teacher for the last couple of decades and being friends with lots of immigrants. And one of the things that I notice is that um, when something happens, even if it isn't happening on a vast scale, the ripples about it make people very, very afraid. And it, it really is extremely unjust that people who contribute so much to our community should have to live with so much fear. So as taking, taking these steps as a city council, you, you are both making people safer can't make them completely safe because the federal government can still come swooping in, but you can make them safer and you also can help to make people feel more comfortable and, and less nervous and worried all the time about what's going to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. David Piccioni followed by Julie Fahey. Hi, there's tremendous suffering in the whole world. That is what seems to be driving the need for appeals for sanctuary. Has anybody stopped to think why their uh, people need to leave their countries and come here where they don't know the language? Uh, 
don't integrate totally well with with uh, the existing culture for various reasons. Uh, I think uh, mm, there's got to be a, a, some some kind of connection between why the people that need sanctuary need sanctuary. It and uh, one of those uh, countries is Yemen. Uh, we just finished se selling. Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, $12.5 billion in weapons. So what's going to happen? So Yemen is going to get raised. The people are going to need sanctuary. So that's what we do. I haven't heard a single person mention about the causes, about why people need sanctuary. The free trade agreements like NAFTA have decimated uh, Latin American communities. Uh, the war on drugs spraying on all edible crops and uh, under the guise of killing uh, plants that are used for, for, for drugs. Uh, and the military intervention in all of the world that we're involved in so heavily and increase with every single president, president that we have, whether Democrat or Republican. So, uh, I'm, I want to help people, but I think we need to help them in their countries. And if they want to come here and live here, that's fine. But I want to also be able to travel to their countries and not get slaughtered by my own government or, or some other kind of problem like the drug cartels or anything like that, that we're so empowering by make, keeping drugs illegal. So thank you. Thank you. Julie Fahey, followed by Emily Ryman. Good evening, everyone. I'm Julie Fahey, the state representative representing the Bethel neighborhood in Eugene, as well as parts of Churchill, Santa Clara, and River Road. Uh, in the 2017 legislative session, I was one of the sponsors of Senate Bill 1051. So I wanted to take the chance to come tonight and talk to you a bit about the intent of that bill as it relates to accessory dwelling units. Statewide, Oregon has a housing shortage of over 150,000 units. That shortage has, the pressures created by that shortage have, in, have increased rent significantly. In Lane County, six in 10 renters are rent burdened. That means that right here in Eugene, there are tens and thousands of people who struggle to find an affordable place to live. In, in the Bethel School District, for example, 10% of the students are homeless. It is not an hyperbole at all to describe the situation as a housing crisis. There are no, there's no one solution that will fix this, this crisis. There's no magic bullet, but it's undeniable that increasing the supply of housing must be part of the solution. So in 2017, the legislature took a very hard look at how we can remove any unnecessary barriers to development that might exist. The overall intent of Senate Bill 1051 was to create more housing in Oregon by removing barriers to development. For the ADU section of the bill in particular, the legislature's goal was to encourage the construction of ADUs and for cities and counties to evaluate whether the regulations of ADUs in their codes were reasonable. I hope that the council and the planning commission will approach this issue with the lens of removing barriers and making it easier to build ADUs. The law does allow for reasonable regulations at the local level relating to siting and design, but those regulations should not be so onerous that they discourage the construction of ADUs. I would suggest that things like Eugene's owner occupancy requirement, parking requirements, and some of the current design requirements don't meet that standard of reasonableness. I encourage you to consider adopting the straightforward rec code recommendations that the Department of Land Conservation and Development issued last month, which clearly reflect this philosophy of removing barriers. Also, I know you're taking a phased approach to this topic, um, it, but it's important to note that in order to be in compliance with the law, by July 1st, any regulations in the code related to ADUs must be reasonable and related to siting and design. In the legislature, we know that cities often face significant pushback about these types of changes. But I believe that we must fight for the tens of thousands of people who can't find an affordable place to live in our community. People who often can't come to these meetings and who may not have the ear of their elected representatives in government, as some of us here tonight do. So we need to be the ones that fight for them. They are counting on us to make decisions that might be difficult and might face some opposition, but that will ultimately improve the lives of people in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Emily Ryman, followed by Julie Tannett. 
Good evening, Council. My name is Emily Ryman. I'm here as a resident of Claire Surrett's ward, as the Executive Director of NEDCO, and also as a member of the Housing Policy Board, um, to speak strongly in favor of the uh, CET that you guys considered earlier this evening at your work session. Um, I support the implementation of a CET at 1%. I also support its implementation as quickly as possible. I support the removal of uh, barriers to missing middle housing as well, but I don't support tying the two together as closely as they have become. And I want to clarify a couple of things that I heard at the work session this evening. When we looked at the slide earlier that talked about the deficit of 13,000 units for our most vulnerable citizens, we're talking about units that are at rents of 650 and below. There is no market solution to that housing. That housing is always going to be subsidized. That's the housing that we can create with a CET, and we're talking about permanent supportive housing. We're talking about transitional housing. We're talking about housing for the most vulnerable people in our community. There are market rate solutions to missing middle housing and to workforce housing, and it's important that we talk about those and that we address them. But I want to make it really clear that these two solutions are to two different problems. They can build on each other, absolutely, because we can use some of the CET dollars to also incentivize workforce housing, and because removing the barriers that exist to workforce housing can allow us to develop affordable units more efficiently and effectively. But there is no part of investigating the code changes and the, the barriers to develop development that will make a CET unnecessary. In order to develop subsidized housing, in order to house the most vulnerable people in our community, we need more resources and we need more dollars. And the CET is a tool that we have now that we can implement that can bring incredibly crucial dollars to our community and to that problem. The housing crisis has existed for years. Our need for those resources has existed for years. And every month that we delay implementing the CET takes us further and further behind in the units that we need to house that community. Thank you. Thank you. Julie Tennant, followed by Luann Koch. Thank you for this opportunity to address the council today. My name is Julie Tannett. I reside on the outskirts of Eugene. I'm here to speak against the including free roaming cats in the proposed wildlife feeding ban. Feeding free roaming cats helps us manage them. It helps us catch them, spay neuter them, and vaccinate them against rabies. By neutering the cats, we not only reduce the number of unwanted wild kittens being born in Eugene, we also eliminate the most aggravating behavior, breathing behaviors like tomcat spraying, midnight cat fights, and yowling. By vaccinating them, we reduce disease that could affect owned cats and also help prevent rabies in our city. By managing the population, we make the free roaming cats better neighbors for our citizens. For nearly five years, I have volunteered my time doing TNR here in Eugene. Trap Neuter Return is the nationally recognized most effective and most humane method to manage the free roaming cat population. Trapping and killing cats and or starving cats does not solve the free roaming cat problem. It's been tried and it doesn't work. With TNR programs, kittens, abandoned cats, and friendly cats are identified and taken into human care, then adopted into homes as pets. To continue our work rehoming abandoned cats and managing the untamed cats, we must feed them. I urge the council to seek progressive, humane methods to address the issues around community cats. Please do not implement regressive behavior, uh, measures. Please do not include feral cats in the proposed wildlife feeding ban. The cats might even help you address the city's problem with rats. Thank you. Thank you. Lu Luann Cox, followed by... Uh, Daniel Borson. Thank you. My name is Luann Cuck. I am the current president of the board of Cat Rescue Adoption Network. We are an all-volunteer, no-kill, 501c3 nonprofit here in Eugene. Our mission is to care for adoptable cats and kittens until they are accepted and adopted into loving and permanent homes. I want to speak on behalf of the community cats, the feral cats that live in this area, and I want to speak against the proposed addition of feral cats in the proposed feeding ban. 
trap, neuter, return, rescuing, and rehoming when those are options are part of the solution to controlling the colonies of feral cats. Cran has taken in, spayed, and neutered, and vaccinated, and found homes for more than 4,000 cats and kittens in the last 10 years. We serve the greater Eugene Springfield community. Uh, one of the ways that we assist in the community is through trap, neuter, return. When someone contacts our organization about unhomed kitties, we send a volunteer out to assess the situation. Um, if the cats or kittens are friendly and no owner is found, we can take them, spay, neuter, vaccinate, find homes for them. If they are feral or unsocialized, our volunteers that can then carry out a trap, neuter, return project, getting them spayed, neutered, uh, vaccinated and returned to their neighborhood where they contribute to the neighborhood as working cats. Uh, working cats can be an effective tool for dealing with the problems of rodents in the community as an example. There are many causes of cat overpopulation, uh, among them human indifference and lack of responsibility. We believe that if the city council would support our work, uh, we could educate the community about the importance of spay neuter, keep your pet cats indoors, control the population of the cats outdoors, and um, it would all contribute to the quality of life in the community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Daniel Borson. Followed by David Woken. Good, good, good evening, Council. Um, I'm Daniel Borson. I reside in Ward 2. Um, I'm here to speak on the proposed changes to the city ordinance concerning the rights of individuals that would state that no city personnel, law enforcement, or others could collect information about any individually identifiable information regarding the gender, gender identity, or sexual orientation, among other statuses. I identify as a gay man. I know from personal conversations that there are many in the LGBTQ community who already do not trust what they see as a heterosexist establishment, and they especially distrust law enforcement. Because of this distrust, they are less likely to report LGBTQ-related crimes and other crimes, and are just in general less likely to engage or cooperate with public officials. Passing this, the changes to this ordinance would send a clear and unequivocal message to the LGBTQ community that the city is committed to protecting the most vulnerable among us and to building trust with all of Eugene's citizens. While there may be additional effort on the part of, of city staff to implement this ordinance, I believe that the trust and goodwill that the city gains from marginalized communities through this ordinance would um, more than pay for itself an improved quality of life in Eugene for those in marginalized communities and for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. David Woken, followed by Carmen Urbina. Thank you. Um, so yes, I'm David Wilkin, Ward 7. Um, I'm a, also a librarian at the University of Oregon, member of the University of Oregon Dreamers Working Group, and an officer of the United Academics, the faculty union. Uh, I'm also speaking in support of the um, expanding the protection from individuals uh, ordinance. Um, keep it relatively brief since I'm here, but I do in my work. I both I work with and advocate for and do what I can to protect um, our undocumented students, students from mixed status families, DACA recipients, and several others who are covered by this ordinance. Um, and that it really has done quite a bit of, it has been helpful in, in giving some reassurance, at least, to our to these students and their families. Um, and I think we should offer similar to other communities that are not yet covered as well, and that also are feeling under threat. Um, I would just point out, as has already been mentioned, there is a very uh, we are facing down a potential repeal of the state's law, uh, similar law, and so having a strong protection in Eugene, in place in Eugene, is a reassurance for people should that happen. The other, uh, also, I don't know how many of you saw, but yesterday the Reg Register guarded an article about how the Springfield police are cooperating with ICE um, to uh, house immigration detainees. Um, so this is very much something relevant and active happening here. Um, so whatever you can do to expand and 
strengthen this ordinance, give it some teeth and make it actually you know, provide even more protection for more communities that are feeling targeted in this time uh, is invaluable. Thank you. Thank you. Carmen Urbina followed by Bob Bussell. Good evening. My name is Carmen Ciumar Urbina. Uh, thank you very much. I'm here to speak on behalf of uh, the naming of the Andrea Ortiz Park and also highly support um, the naming of a building for Dr. Coleman. I want to speak about Andrea and I want to please raise your hand if you're here because of the Andrea Ortiz naming of the park. Mm -hmm. And we ask everybody to wear red um, in remembering that that was one of her favorite colors. Andrea believed in the greater good of our community. The ripple effects that Andrea has, not only as sitting as part of the city council, but on Bethel School Board, multiple boards and committees. She believed in children, she believed in families, she believed in coalitions, she believed in building bridges. Her legacy still has the ripple effects and will have ripple effects in this community forever. So, once again, it's really hard to speak about Andrea and not cry. Um, not only because she was a close friend, she was my sister, but also the amazing work that she modeled for all of us to be involved in a city that she loved, a community that she loved. And speaking about the greater good, I'm also here to speak on behalf of safe cities. I am an immigrant. I am from Honduras and I work with immigrants. And understanding and knowing that in the time of the clock of the world that we're currently in, we're waking up to a new reality every single day. And every single day, communities that are underserved and marginalized are falling more into fear. A fear that I don't think that if you are in that situation, you can even fathom what that looks like, sounds like, and feels like in real time. When we have kindergartners afraid that they might come back and their parents might not be there. And just a gentle reminder that we were, in 1997, many of you were part of the last ICE raid and how that impacted our community in waves that we are still recovering from. So just a gentle reminder of what that was like and to speak to people that were victims of that raid and the violations of human rights, social justice. And it is up to us, city, local cities, to defend and protect our communities because unfortunately our government is not going to do it. Therefore, we need to step up and do it and not be silent on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Bussell followed by Mary Layton. Good evening, Mayor and uh, Venison Councilors. My name is Bob Bussell. I live in Ward 4. I'm affiliated with the Integration Network for Immigrants in Lane County. And so in my capacity with IN, I stand in strong support and solidarity for the extension of the Eugene City Ordinance concerning the rights of individuals uh, along the lines that others have suggested. I wanted to direct the bulk of my brief remarks to uh, speak on behalf of naming a city park and a community building uh, for Andrea Ortiz and Dr. Edwin Coleman. Names matter. So let me tell you a brief story that illustrates the importance of the naming of city facilities. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, a town that's been in the news quite a bit lately. In Memphis, there's a park called Forest Park. It's named after Nathan Bedford Forrest, a Confederate general and the founder of the Ku Klux Klan. The city just recently changed the name of Forrest Park and removed a statue of Forrest in December under the cover of darkness. But as a child, it filtered down to me that Forrest was, as one website for a state park in his name states, he was an intrepid cavalry leader and military tactician. That name legitimated a leading advocate of white supremacy, and only years later did I understand who Forrest was and what he stood for. So names matter. They allow us to put our values in action and underscore what our community stands for. So we have the opportunity to name a park and a community center after two people, Andrea Ortiz and Dr. Edwin Coleman, who are models of engaged citizenship and through their exemplary lives left our community a far better place. It would be a fitting tribute to them personally, a long overdue acknowledgement of the contributions that people of color have made to our community, and a powerful statement of our community's commitment to the principles of equity and inclusion. I urge you to take the necessary steps to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mary Layton, followed by hmm, Otella Seltz, maybe? Okay. I'm Mary Layton. I live in Ward 2. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of enhancing the original ordinance, which I'm glad you passed for a safe city. Like most Americans, I'm the descendant of immigrants, some as recent recent as my grandpa's, on both sides, who were not only immigrants, but they were very active politically, Democrats, I might say, uh, ward healers in one case. <laughs> um, but they were solid members of the middle class. They took their participation very seriously. My uh, sister-in-law comes from Mexico City, and under I don't know what conditions, but I know right now her, she's got her papers in order, and she's running one of the hotels in downtown Chicago where she started work. Um, I have a nephew who's uh, become a niece in recent days, uh, and several who participate in other places on the gender identity uh, issue. All of these people are upstanding Americans, party affiliations aside, they're not all Democrats, uh, um, they are all fine members of their community. They deserve the rich lives they have chosen to, to make. They, they don't need to be worried all the time. They don't need to be thinking that somewhere somebody is going to under, un, uncover some record of an affiliation the uncoverer doesn't like, and suddenly they're going to be in trouble for something that is a born to uh, feature that overcomes all of the things they have chosen to do as adults and as Americans. So I urge you to take the time necessary to explore the problems with the current uh, ordinance, uh, the deficiencies that uh, emerge, you know, everybody writes first drafts and second drafts and discovers something needs to be fixed. Take the time to fix it, and meanwhile, do what has been asked. Back off, implement, uh, yeah, have, ask John to do what it takes to stop people collecting that, that information until you have an official on the record rule that, dis, that takes everything into account. Rather, we should err on the side of welcome and inclusion than participate in some of the madness that's going on elsewhere as if we would have ever survived without all the wonderful contributions of the crazy diversity that constitutes American life when it's flourishing at its best. Thank you. Thank you. Otella, or Ophelia, sorry, I can't read it. Sells, followed by Felicitas Caballero. Hi, my name is Ophelia Searles. Oh, um, there you go. I've lived in Eugene since 1987. Um, I was coerced into moving here by my baby sister, Andrea Ortiz. Um, I find it's a very lovely community, I've been, and except for the one year I lived in Springfield, I've always been here. Um, but uh, I wasn't prepared to say anything tonight, but I am advocating for the park naming for her. She was a tireless volunteer for this community. She loved you, and she got most of my family to love you, too. And um, I, I think it's very fitting that she and her family should receive this. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Felicitas Caballero, followed by Christine Carranza, or Carranza. I, as usual, I got roped into speaking and I didn't really want to. <laughs> Par for the course, Andrea. Um, my sister is Andrea Ortiz, and I'm here to say that I think it would be a wonderful contribution. Um, her tireless work in the community is, is, I mean, even with or without a committee, she had us out there cleaning the schools or building extra playgrounds or whatever. I remember her dragging me along all this time in Eugene and how much she loved it. And she's the reason we all moved up here um, from California. And uh, I really uh, can't say enough about her. Um, of course, I'm biased, but uh, I just think it would be a really wonderful thing to encourage young women of color to pursue anything. You know, she always, she always said that. There's nothing you can't do if you put your mind to it. And uh, I just wish I had her tenacity in her, in her drive. But um, barring that, I think a park named after her would be very appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Christine Carranza, followed by Rebecca Flynn. My name is Christine Carranza, and I am also 
a sister of Andrea Ortiz, and that's why I'm here today, because I am hoping that she can get a park named after her. She has, still has family here in the area and grandkids, and I think they need to see, and, and others need to see that you can come from nothing and still become something. And she did um, a lot for the community. She got on lots of committees and fought her way through. And yes, yeah, the word tenacious does seem to fit her. And uh, anyway, I would appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca Flynn, followed by Bob Cassidy. Hi, everybody. Um, I am from Ward 2, and I'm here um, to testify about two things. One is in support of the park named for Andrea Ortiz. Um, in a lot of places, I've seen her characterized as a Latina leader, and she certainly is a, uh, was a Latina and certainly a leader of the Latinx community, but I very much consider her a community leader, period. Um, about 12 years ago, the LGBT community or a number of members of that community uh, boycotted the Register Guard and had a big rally out in front of the Register Guard because of their discriminar uh, discriminatory birth announcement policy. And that day, I remember seeing Andrea there. And because I was one of the main organizers, I knew that we had not invited her specifically. And so I went up to her and I said, what are you doing here? Thank you. And she said, well, it's the right thing to do. I couldn't not be here. And for me, um, I was new to the city, and to have a city councilor come and stand with us was very, very important, and I felt like she had our back. Uh, so that was important to me. At the beginning of this, I heard Joel Iboa mention that it's important to kids of color to have a park uh, named for a woman of color and a building named for a man of color. As a mom, it's important for me and my kids, too, to understand uh, what people of color have given to this community. And we do talk about place names, so I consider that important to my family as well. Want to mention um, that Andrea uh, was very well respected in the medical community here. She ran a very tight ship at the ER at Sacred Heart. Um, I uh, was formerly married to a doctor who said the doctors were somewhat intimidated by her, which I just have to love if you know the ego of doctors. Um, so uh, uh, I'm in full support of that. In terms of safe cities, I want to say I'm very much here in support of that as well. I participated in a listening session, uh, I don't know, a year ago, organized by the Human Rights Commission here. Uh, they were interviewing uh, LGBT folks, white folks, and folks of color. In our meeting, the question was, do you feel safe in Eugene? For those of us who were white, middle-class lesbians, we all said that we felt safe. And to a person, the LGBT um, people of color in the room said they do not feel safe in Eugene. And that was very telling to, to me about my own privilege. And one community leader who often is a speaker on campus and in the community said she does not feel safe outside her home. Uh, I'd also like to say I'm the daughter of an immigrant who came to this country without a high school education. We, I was on the free lo school lunch program. We got government cheese. No one has ever cl complained about her or uh, asked why she came here, because she's from Europe. Mm -hmm. So I see the difference. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Cassidy, followed by Marshall Peter. Bob Cassidy, Alan Zelenka's warden. Yesterday, this is a different subject. Yesterday, the Register Guard took an editorial negative editorial position on the auditor issue, unlike seven of the eight of you. Their highlights were that we could fund more police services with the money going to the auditor. When I first met Gary Blackmer 25 years ago, he was a performance auditor in Portland. One of his first audits was the police department, who at the time were requesting more police officers. The city council at that time really wanted to go into community policing. After the audit, the police department and the auditor came back to the council saying that, in fact, they didn't need any more police. In fact, they had enough 
officers for community policing. Maybe the police audit here would help us evaluate the merging of Eugene Springfield Police Departments as we did with the fire department. And we saved gobs money on that. Was, what was that, two million? Maybe all of this is being considered by our city staff and the new police chief, but I doubt it. We need an elected performance auditor. Gary Blackmer will be speaking here Thursday the 18th at 7 o'clock. He's a very interesting speaker. Thank you. Marshall Peter, followed by Jenny Allen. Yes, hi, I'm Marshall Peter. I'm in Betty Taylor's ward. I don't really know the numbers anymore. Um, I'm not at all well prepared, but I am clearly intended. I, I want to speak very much in favor of the recognition of Andre Ortiz and Ed Coleman, who are certainly um, incredible community heroes and deserving of any recognition at all that you would be able to afford them. I also want to speak in favor of the safe city and the expansion of the protection for individuals. I had a chance back when Jeff Miller was mayor to be part of a group that slugged it out over a prolonged period of time to write the original human rights ordinance and it was very hard work but we all came together and I think that one of the values that was so very important to everyone who was part of that group was to be sure that everyone in this community felt safe and well protected and I don't think any of us anticipated all of the ways that people might feel excluded, but I think that it's really consistent with the Eugene that I want to live in, that we, in fact, are a safe community, um, that we expand our sanctuary protections, and that we be sure that all of the individuals who live in this community are protected regardless of whatever sort of status might stand in the way. Thank you very much for all your hard work. Thank you. Jenny Allen, followed by Ruth Dumour. Hello, I'm Jenny Allen. I'm from Ward 4, and I'm here to speak about the housing issue. Um, I am a member of First Congregational Church at 23rd and Harris, and I am um, specifically a member of the housing initiative team within our church. For many years, our church has been involved with various housing um, partners within the community, including St. Vincent de Paul's overnight shelter for more than 27 years. A year and a half ago, a working group from three neighborhood groups in South Eugene came to us with a proposal. They were developing a plan to jointly apply for grants to support affordable housing in the South Eugene area. Their idea um, was, and they came to us for asking if they could cite three tiny homes on our property for singles or couples to live in. With the grant deadline occurring in 30 days over the Christmas holidays wasn't the best timing for a church to try and get this done, so unfortunately we had to withdraw from participating. But it got us thinking. And once we learned there were children from 33 homeless families attending Edison Elementary School only two blocks away, we began to ask ourselves a very important question. How could we use our property to support the many homeless families in our area? We began researching existing community services for potential partnerships in order to give these families the best chance of success. We learned that St. Vincent de Paul's Connections program had a 91% success rate of moving families from homelessness into stable housing. Then, after talking with Terry McDonald, he offered to provide case management for the potential families and place two small homes on our property if we would provide the space and infrastructure for them. Great. This didn't take that long. Well, a year and a half later, we are trying to find a way to do this through one city program or another, but continue to run into code problems. We found we can have one dwelling or three or more, but the number two isn't listed anywhere. The three or more category requires a PUD, which is much more complicated and very expensive for such a small project, especially for a faith community. 
So our housing initiative team began to work through the process. We've participated in meetings, hearings, talked multiple times to staff, the housing board and its task force, and the planning commission. The reality is the code needs a simple edit. I'm here to encourage you to pass the code correction recommended by the planning commission that says, in relation to places of worship, to allow for two dwellings exclusively for low-income housing as permitted use. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ruth Dimler, followed by Roy Ward. So many things to talk about tonight. <laughs> I hardly know where to start. Um, but first of all, I'd like to say about an inclusive community. Eugene is really a beautiful community, and we need to enhance it and be inclusive. I would certainly urge you to have the two parks named for Andrea and for Ed. They were two people that were loving in our community, always welcoming new strangers. Um, they're two people that did so much for, in every way, to, for our community. I do urge you to do that. Also, um, I'm here to say about the CET, the construction excise tax. I was surprised to find out that so many communities in Oregon already have this tax. They're already using it. They're already developing low-cost housing. I was really very surprised to see that there was any objection to it and that we're so late in doing this. I do urge you to have that passed so that we can have more housing, more housing for St. Benny's, the article that was written in NEDCO, that was written so well in the paper the other day. Um, I do urge you to do that. Um, we need increased housing. Every day, more and more people appear to be homeless. So um, thinking of the housing situation, another way to improve our community, and also being inclusive and welcoming to people of all races. Thank you. Thank you. Roy Ward? Followed by Sherry Briggs. Uh, hello, I'm Roy Ward. I'm in Betty Taylor's ward, and I'm here to speak in favour of extending the ordinance on collection of information. I've spoken, I've spoken here before on, as a very recent immigrant, how well I've been treated, and how well, and how I want everyone to get that. But I thought tonight I would speak as. Um, I'm the lead engineer of a small technology company, which, by the way, I do not speak for. Um, and part, and this, this I know through my job, but it's a, it's a general knowledge anyway, that information has gotten much easier to collect, store, transmit, analyse, process. It's, 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 it's become something that is much easier to, to, to deal with. But in doing that, it's also become much easier to abuse, and, there's some, and there are some really bad actors out there, and unfortunately, some of them would appear to be in the federal government. Um, and so I would urge the, the, the City Council to um, only collect information like that is really required to help the people inf the information is being collected for. Um, no, and, 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 the, and no, particularly not collect information about marginal groups where the information is not required. Uh, I sat in on the working group when the ordinance was discussed, uh, and I know why. I know it's hard. I know that the, there's a lot of time has to be taken surveying the, the various departments, finding out what's being collected, making sure there's no conflicts. I would say that that's something that needs, that needs to be done anyway, just, just simply from the fact of information safety and not having information that you don't need to have. Because yes, it's a cost to do this, but it's also a liability to have information that you that you don't need. In, in today's world, it's really becoming that way. So, I, so please extend with all possible speed, extend the ordinance to cover uh, to cover other affected groups and not just only collect information that you need. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry Briggs, followed by David Says. Hello, my name is Sherry Briggs and I live in Betty Taylor's ward and um, I'm here to say that I oppose uh, feral cats being included in any proposed wildlife ban. Um, I've managed feral cat colonies in this community for 25 years um, 
and want to share a few things that I've observed and learned over time. Um, it's really important to understand that feral cats are not wildlife. Um, they are domestic cats that have never been handled. Um, they are often the offspring of cats that were abandoned at one time. Um, some cats in a colony are often tame, but they need to be trapped uh, because they are in survival mode and they can't be approached. TNR really works. Um, I currently attend a colony in the university area. Over the course of several years, I took out approximately 75 cats. Um, a lot of them students, I think, had left behind. Um, many of them were tame and were all in rough condition. Um, they, they eventually were rehomed. Uh, Fifteen were fixed and returned. Uh, the colony remained stable for several years. Uh, now there are only two remaining in that colony. And again, TNR really works. Um, strain feral cats are a human created situation and uh, the suffering that you witness when you're doing this work out there is just beyond words. Um, each and every one of these cats deserve a humane outcome. And uh, the city of Eugene, we have a lot of, um, or a few, uh, really good um, free and low-cost spay and neuter programs to help help with this situation and we really need to get the education out there so more people know about these programs so we can alleviate uh, animal suffering in this community as well as um, help people who want to do the right thing for feral cats. Thank you. Thank you. David Saez followed by Kelly Coulter and Nicole West. Hi, good evening. Uh, yeah, my name is David Saez, and I live in uh, Ward 3 and work in Ward 7. Um, I work with Centro Latino Americano, and I'm uh, a member of the Latinx Alliance of Lane County and the Integration Network for Immigrants of Lane County. Um, first, I just want to thank you for uh, having passed the ordinance uh, concerning the rights of individuals last March and uh, for ensuring that we have, uh, we, we put our values out there publicly. Uh, as part of the Latinx community and as a service provider, uh, I recognize the importance of the city's willingness to do everything necessary to make sure that all Eugene residents are treated with respect and dignity, no matter their immigration status. Uh, every individual in our community deserves to be free to live a safe and healthy life. The passing of this ordinance, ordinance has helps, continues to help uh, to counter the hostile rhetoric and behavior that has been promoted by our federal administration. Um, because of this, uh, the federal administration, uh, we will likely continue, uh, because they, are, they will continue to likely stoke the flame of hate towards some in our community, uh, we who have a voice are responsible for doing uh, what must be done to stand up for the values of kindness and respect that are lacking in Washington, D.C. Uh, that is why I want to say that I agree and support uh, the uh, additions or uh, amendments that need to be made to that ordinance and uh, hope that you would push forward uh, with that. Uh, lastly, I just want to ask that you also uh, waive the naming policy for parks so that we can name uh, the Royal Elizabeth Park in Bethel neighborhood after the late uh, city council member Andrea Ortiz and the Westmoreland Community Center uh, after the late Dr. Edwin uh, Coleman. I believe their status as respected elders and their service and contributions to our community merit that waiver and uh, hope that you will do so. Thank you for your time and uh, hope that you are able to move forward with that promptly. Thanks. Thank you. Kelly Coulter and Nicole West, followed by Misha English. Um, good evening. My name is Kelly Coulter. I live in Ward 8. Um, I'm here with Nicole West. Um, the two of us have been involved with a nonprofit animal rescue, Sarah, for many years. Um, we're here because we oppose the inclusion of feral cats in the wildlife feeding ban. Um, and Nicole West, our cat rescue coordinator, has a few words to say. Hello, I'm Nicole West. I live in Cottage Grove. Um, Sarah is a nonprofit animal organization that was started in Eugene back in 2001. We oppose including feral cats in the possible wildlife feeding ban. Sarah is an advocate for and actively involved in TNR for feral cats. Uh, TNR stands for Trap, Neuter, and Return. T 
TNR utilizes a colony caregiver who provides food, water, vet care as necessary, and addresses any new arrivals to the colony. TNR stops the reproductive cycle. In animal welfare, it's accepted as the humane method of controlling the cat population, and at the same time, nuisance behaviors such as spraying, vocalization, and fighting are largely eliminated. Importantly though, TNR is not only effective to address overpopulation, but also effective for cutting government spending. TNR is the least costly and most efficient way to reduce feline overpopulation. Catch and kill is expensive and it has been proven again and again to not work. Including feral cats in the feeding ban makes TNR impossible. Sarah encourages the city to learn more about the benefits of TNR and research alternatives to a sweeping feeding ban. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Misha English, followed by Rabbi Jacob Siegel. Good evening, Councillors, Mayor Venice. My name is Misha English, and I'm the president of Willamette Animal Guild, our local low-cost, high-volume spay-neuter clinic, better known as WAG. I am here to briefly speak to the city councilors' apparent contemplation upon the idea of act enacting some sort of wildlife feeding ban in Eugene, and I'm here to urge the council to refrain from including feral cats in any resulting prohibition. WAG just celebrated its 10th year and its 50,000th spay-neuter surgery in Eugene. Of those surgeries, roughly 6,000 were feral cats. This number of altered feral cats represents conservatively 30,000 less feral cats born in Lane County in the last 10 years because of WAG and its feral caregiving clients. This calculation only assumes single generational impact and only five animals per litter, which is why it is such a conservative figure. Green Hill reports averaging approximately 1,000 feral cats altered at their facility each year. That means that collectively, WAG and Green Hill and the countless number of tireless local colony cat caregivers and TNR advocates have prevented the birth of over 80,000 feral cats in Eugene in the last 10 years. But if you can't feed, you can't trap. And if you can't trap, you can't fix. WAG asks that this council not undo the years of work, money, time, and care that so many Eugene citizens have put into the humane care for these cats and the control of their populations. Education and more financial support for spay, neuter, and TNR is the answer, not a feral cat feeding ban. Please, counselors, let's keep Eugene humane. Thank you. Thank you. Rabbi Jacob Siegel, followed by Oriana Khan Hurwit. Thank you all for your time. I need, my name is Jacob Siegel. I'm in Alan Zelenka's ward. I just want to, before I speak about my main issue, add my voice to the others. Uh, encouraging the council to strengthen the Eugene Ordinance concerning the rights of individuals. So I am the head of the Eugene Eruv Committee, a collaboration between members of the Jewish community, including members of the Jewish Federation of Lane County, Ahavas Torah, Temple Beth Israel, all with a common goal to create an Eruv in Eugene. Traditional Jewish observance prohibits many acts on the Sabbath, including carrying, everything from carrying a cane to pushing a stroller. The ancient rabbis recognized a communal need and created a symbolic designation called an Eruv that permits carrying within a specifically designated area on the Sabbath. The creation of an Eruv is an issue of religious accommodation and support for diversity within the city of Eugene. Here are a couple of important details. The creation of an Eruv in no way affects other residents of the city of Eugene while providing important religious accommodation for the Jewish community, in particular for members with mobility issues or those with young children. There are over 200 Eruvs across the country, including Portland, Seattle, Los Angeles, and four in the Bay Area. 
the language of the resolution in front of you has been carefully workshopped by an expert in Jewish law as well as the city attorney's office to meet the requirements on all fronts. In particular, the language of renting, the right to make an Eruv is essential for the Eruv to be legitimate in Jewish law. I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Uh, this resolution does not actually create an Eruv, it's just the first step in the process and the Jewish community will be working over the coming months to finish the Eruv. The Jewish community is diverse, some of the Jews in Eugene have a more traditional practice that relies on an Eruv, but we know that the Council's willingness to help in this process demonstrates a welcoming attitude and an embrace of diversity that impacts positively on the entire Jewish community. So I encourage the Council to, council to support this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Oriana Khan Hurwitt, followed by George Tanner. Hello, I live in Ward 1. Um, and while I'm not here to address the, um, the additions and changes to the ordinance concerning the rights of individuals or renaming the park and Westmoreland Community Center, I would like to state my support for those things. Um, I am the social worker for Jewish Family Services, which is a project of Jewish Federation of Lane County. And we are an organization that supports the Jewish community in the entire community, in, in the entire county and in Eugene. And our organization provides social services which include caring for the more vulnerable within our community. Um, the Eugene Jewish community is very diverse, as Rabbi Siegel said, and it includes many levels of religious observance. The, while the Eruv is an issue for um, religious accommodation, passage of this resolution would greatly help uh, the more traditionally observant members of our community who do require mobility aids, such as walkers and canes. And as such, the Jewish Federation of Lane County supports the creation of an Eruv and encourages that the council pass this resolution. Thank you for your hard work on behalf of the community. Thank you. George Tanner, followed by Lauren Herbert. Good evening. Thank you. My name is George Tanner. Uh, my wife and my, I moved to Eugene in 2009 after I retired in order to be uh, closer to our daughter. Uh, my son-in-law grew up in Eugene, and his parents have lived here for over 40 years. Uh, I am a board member and secretary of Congregation Ahavas Torah, which is a small, traditional uh, Jewish Orthodox uh, synagogue, which has been in existence in Eugene for about 25 years. I think the establishment of an Arab in Eugene would be a great boon to our community. With an era of observant Jews are allowed to carry in the public domain on the Sabbath. Uh, for example, they can bring food to someone else's house or push a baby carriage on the Sabbath without violating Jewish law. Uh, and just to give you an example, we have a young rabbi who leads services at our synagogue, and he has a four year old daughter. Uh, they live about a half a mile from our synagogue, and it, it would be a uh, very helpful if uh, she would be able to be pushed in a stroller and instead of having to walk that uh, great distance. I know all the members of our synagogue uh, would be extremely pleased to have a, an heir of in Eugene. I moved to Eugene from Indianapolis, Indiana. We had an heir of on the north side of Indianapolis and it worked well. I see no downside to the general community in having an Arab in Eugene, and I think it's a wonderful idea to, to have uh, uh, such, a, um, uh, such a thing set up in our community. And it, uh, approval of this uh, project would certainly uh, support the idea that uh, Eugene is a welcoming uh, community for people of all religions and um, uh, of all uh, types of individuals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lauren Herbert, followed by Kimber Kimberly Gladden. Hi, I'm Lauren Herbert. I live in uh, Ward 3. I'm a pediatrician at Peace Health. I'm also a member of Integration Network and Oregon Pediatric Society. Um, I so, I'm um, talking to support the extension of the Eugene City Ordinance concerning the rights of individuals. I think we need to do all we can to protect immigrants. Um, deportation rips apart families and damages our community. 
Almost all the patients in my clinic are children of immigrants. I speak Spanish, so most of my the kids in my the families in my clinic are Latino. Um, their parents work hard so that their children can have the opportunities that they never had. They're very devoted. It's, it's a privilege to be a part of their lives, to share in the pride and joy as their children grow, form friendships, learn, help their families. These are wonderful community members. I'm also a member of the American Board of Pediatrics, so that's an organization that writes exams to certify and recertify pedi pediatricians. One of the content specifications assigned to me recently was understand the barriers to health care for children of undocumented immigrants. That gave me the sad opportunity to review articles about the psychological effects on children when their parents were deported and about the economic hardships on the remaining family members if a single parent were deported. <coughs> Impact is what one would expect, depression, anxiety, poverty. In my clinic, parents have been deported. Other family members have stepped up to take care of the children. I'm very thankful to the extended family member but we all know it's not the same. Um, I also have become very close to these people in my clinic, and it is, I don't ask who's documented and who's not documented, but I dread the day that I come in and there's somebody not there because they've been deported. So I'm also worried about the psychological effects on the rest of our community if we let ICE deport people. I was born and raised here, this is, community's not perfect, but it's a community I know, and we help each other and care for each other, and we give back. If this community allows ICE to take away parents, if we turn our backs on our neighbors, we lose part of who we are. Thank you. Kimberly Gladden, followed by Carla Herbert. Hi, I'm Kimberly Gladden, and I live downtown. Um, I'm here to talk about downtown safety. I don't feel safe in my neighborhood downtown. I rarely leave my house after dark. I live in low-income housing near the Wall Hall. Um, I have to take the bus everywhere. I take the bus every day. And when I get off the bus at the bus station, and if I want to go to the library on my way home or stop at LCC, there's a problem on that corner, a big problem on that corner. It's not just the cigarette smoke and the marijuana smoke. It's the fights and the aggression and the definite rudeness, people not letting you go across the street. And a lot of this is rampant all over the downtown. You can sit in the cafe on the corner of Broadway and Turnalton, which is on my way home, and watch drug deals go down across the street on that corner all day. People have openly dealt drugs in this town on the streets, for the last 12 years, and I've been coming here for the last 11 years now and talking to you about it and nothing's been done. I've asked repeatedly that that corner be non-smoking. The library's non-smoking, LCC's non-smoking. You have a security guard over at the atrium to protect you and other city officials. I would like to see the corner by the bus station there made non-smoking. And please don't tell me you're gonna make the whole downtown non-smoking. We all know that's BS. I really strongly feel we need a police officer over there to deal with some of the behavior problems because there's a lot. And I know drugs are being dealt down there because when I take the EMX in from Springfield, a lot of the high school students also take the EMX in and they talk a lot in the back of the bus about who down there on that corner is gonna be giving them drugs, alcohol, marijuana, cigarettes, etc. They have a regular pattern of predators on that corner. Just destroying the lives of our youth. There's also other problems downtown. Um, there are at least five illegal homeless camps in and around the area within a block radius of where I live. The other day coming home from church, a young man came out the alley past the portage on there, walked up to a window of one of the local businesses, unzipped his pants, took out his penis, and appeared to be either going to pee on the windows of that business or jack off. Luckily, he looked around to see who was there, saw me, put it back in his pants, zipped it back up, and wandered off down to one of the homeless camps in the area where I live. That particular business has had their windows broken now three times and I believe it is racially motivated. Nobody should have to deal with this in the downtown who lives here, let alone families with children and businesses. 
and I want you to do something about it. It's time. It's been years you've allowed this to go on. Thank you. Thank you. Carla Herbert, followed by Molly Craig. Hi, I'm Carla Herbert. I live in the River Road area, and I'm proudly another crazy cat lady. Um, so I'm here, obviously, to talk about the wildlife feeding ban, um, including the feral cats. I probably should have rewrote my talk a little bit because we've heard a lot about the importance of the trap neuter return. But um, yes, I am concerned about this sweeping wildlife feeding ban to control the rat and turkey overpopulation. Unfortunately, this ban lumps feral cats in with turkeys, rats, and all other wildlife. Backyard bird feeders have also been proposed to be included in this ban. I urge city council members to really research this complicated issue. Um, Sarah's, the Shelter Animal Resource Alliance, and many other organizations and hardworking folks um, spend a lot of their volunteer time um, working hard to get feral cat populations under control through the TNR. Uh, we've heard and it's been proven that the TNR, the trap neuter return, has been proven to be most effective, humane, and economic way to control feral and stray cat populations. As you've heard, um, we need food to be in the trap to allow the cat to be spayed, neutered, vaccinated, returned to the colony, and then they're fed and monitored for health. Um, once the population is altered, it will stabilize and shrink. So um, if we don't feed them, they run the risk of catching parasites and diseases, and some which can affect the human population. Trapping for euthanasia or starving the cat population is not effective and very inhumane. Um, we know that the trap neuter return improves lives of cats, addresses community concerns, reduces complaints about cats, drops the breeding cycle. And that's why so many cities are adopting it. There's scientific studies. I have some really good information I printed out if you'd be interested from LA Cats Allies. They actually set the standards and guidelines for the TNR for this country after it was very successful in the UK. Um, scientific studies, interesting, um, like University of Florida, the number of cats on campus decreased by 60, 60 per, 66%, and interestingly enough, many of the cats um, were socialized and therefore adopted. Um, before the TNR programs, for over 100 years, the America shel American Shelter and Animal Control System has been catching and killing outdoor cats to control their population which continues to fail, despite the fact that millions of healthy outdoor cats are killed each year, and wasting taxpayers' money. When these cats are removed from an area, it creates a vacuum in the environment, and then new cats move in, and then take advantage of the available resources. <clears throat> they breed, and we're back to square one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Molly Craig, followed by Pauline Romo. Hi, my name is Molly Craig. I live in Springfield, but I've done a lot of TNR work both in Springfield and in Eugene. And I can certainly confirm everything that everybody has said this evening. Um, and um, I think it would be truly wonderful if both Eugene, the city of Eugene, and the city of Springfield would give us more support in what we're trying to do. Um, we're doing it by ourselves, and uh, none of us have all that much money, and a lot of us work, and um, I think these groups have accomplished so much, but certainly some support from our governments would help us be that much more successful. Thank you. Thank you. Paulina Romo, followed by John Roth. Hello, good evening. Thank you very much for um, letting us speak tonight. Um, my name is Paulina Romo, and I am the executive director of Downtown Languages. We serve um, a lot of uh, different immigrant populations. And um, today I'm here to um, ask you, uh, first, of, first of all, to thank you for um, passing the, the ordinance concerning the rights of individuals. But we'd like to ask everybody else as a express, a extend that um, ordinance too, um, so that no city personnel, law enforcement, or others uh, will collect or maintain individual 
identifiable information on immigration status, um, race, ethnicity, national origin, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, housing status or disability. Um, I work with immigrants, as I said, every day, and every day uh, there's a different story about fear, something that causes uh, people to not want to leave their home. Uh, for example, this weekend, I try not to give my telephone number to students, but sometimes I get it. So this weekend I got called if they, somebody wanted to go, if they could go to the Saturday market, because they heard that ICE might, might be in town. And, um, you know, as a person that, that I'm supposed to have information, I haven't heard anything about that. But people are constantly in that fear of, uh, is ICE going to be here or not? You know, if they stop me, what kind of information are they going to ask me to, um, to reveal? Uh, or, or anybody else, a policeman. And uh, so it, it would be nice if at least we can tell our students, well, you know, the city <laughs> uh, will try to take any measures so that, that that information is not collected about you and so there's less chance of, of you being singled out. Um, I often also think about what caused uh, some of my students to be displaced and uh, to end up living here under situations that are, you know, very precarious. Many of them are low income, have a lot of barriers. And it is many times policies that, international policies that governments take that are completely outside of the power of people to, you know, decide whether they can continue living where they live. Policies that create violence, that create poverty, and people get displaced. I mean, we're seeing this all over the world right now. And then I often think, so who's responsible for this displacement? And um, sadly, I think um, there's a lot of greed in, in, in federal governments, both here and you know, anywhere else in the world. And it seems to me that uh, local governments you know, have to take the task of being the more ethical ones, the more responsible ones, and all of us, the community as well. So um, an ethical thing to do is to try to protect people that have been displaced because, you know, these policies cause them to do so and they didn't really want to be in the first place. So I think if we can all extend that um, protection, then, um, you know, we ensure that we're doing the, the ethical and moral thing in the world. And I also want to uh, speak on support of the, the parks being named after Dr. Coleman, Andrea, and Andrea Ortiz because of good role models that we need. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. John Roth, followed by our final speaker, Stefan Streck. Good evening, Council. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, my name is John Roth. I'm a physician assistant at Peace Health Pediatrics. Um, and I'm here as an advocate for the families that I serve uh, in clinic uh, and in my community. Um, I work with many immigrant families, as does Dr. Herbert. I, she's my partner. Um, and we have uh, many wonderful families that we get to work with. Uh, but they do live in fear, as everyone has stated. Um, and that's, that's just very unfortunate. I really am very thankful, and I congratulate the council for passing the uh, protection last year. And I hope we can extend that. Uh, and do the best we can to help protect people, um, not just immigrants, but everyone uh, who is in uh, that status. As the uh, gentleman mentioned earlier um, about collecting information, if it's not necessary, don't collect it. Facebook can show us that. Um, and I think that uh, I just like to uh, advocate for all the families that I stand to represent. So thank you for your time, and together we can do it. And uh, I think that, as Mahatma Gandhi once said, we must be the change we wish to see in the world. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker, Stefan Struck. Everybody, thank you very much for coming down here. My name is Stefan Streck, and all of my friends and voters know me as the mayor of Eugene ever since winning the popular vote back in 2016. To this date, I do not concede that election, and to this date, I contest those election results. First off, 
I am here, yes, thank you, Mike. I am here primarily to speak about the City Hall. Many people don't know that this is not City Hall. People tell me all the time, Stefan Streck, Mr. Mayor, I love your speeches to City Council. And I tell them, you know, that's actually not City Hall. That's just the courthouse. You know, they tore down City Hall five years ago with no plan of rebuilding it. And so that's how we get things coming up like me running for U.S. House of Representatives, probably going to get the Republican nomination for a federal office where I have the opportunity to write and vote on federal legislation. I've got pamphlets. I've got buttons with our slogan, winners don't use plan B, we use plan A. Yeah. The t-shirts are fantastic. Also with our slogan, we've sold out of two orders of these already. Yeah. So, I strongly oppose any city funds allocated to capturing and executing free roaming felines in the city of Eugene. It's a stupid idea and it's a waste of money. These are not feral cats. That term is offensive. I have been taking care of my neighbor's cats for almost two years now. They show up twice a day for food. I thought they were feral for seven months before they stopped by and said, these are our cats, by the way. I just took the little guy to the vet for the second time during spring break to get him some medical care. Typical freeloader just wants free food, free medical care. Go figure. Anyways, so... Now, City Hall, we can build it quickly and efficiently. If the Amish can build a barn in a day, how come the City Council can't find the money in $330 million a year that our city has for the budget to build a City Hall? You know, I walked across the street to get a drink. I saw a homeless man, a veteran, and I asked him, what would you say to City Council? What do you want? And he said, tell them I want a job. So. Why can't we do some work getting these people jobs, helping to build our city hall? We can crush the unions that are corrupt and putting people of color and low-income people out of business. And we can put money into the pockets of real Oregonians that deserve the fair opportunity at a better life, good jobs, and money. Vote Streck. Vote Republican. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that completes our public forum. I just have to compliment everyone who spoke because we had 42 speakers in an hour and a half, just in an hour and 35 minutes, which was pretty good, pretty good. So thank you all for coming. Are there counselors who wish to comment? Okay. Councilor Syrett? Anybody else? Councilor Evans? Take it away. Uh, so actually my first comment is going to be a point of personal privilege. I need a new chair. I can't raise this one up. I've been like the kids yeah, sitting I know, at the too. It's like, adults I table all day, know. and it's not going to work for me any longer. Thank you. Um, on a more serious topic, um, I'm disappointed that the that city manager didn't follow up on the work of surveying city departments so we could implement the next part of our protection for individuals. I like the safe city moniker. That's a great name. Um, so I'm disappointed that we apparently have not done that work, which I had been under the impression we were going to do in the, in, after we passed that ordinance, uh, the first part of it last year. So we need to finish that work uh, and modify our ordinance to enhance those protections that we put in place. And uh, if the city manager needs me to sponsor a work session poll to get that work done, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I would look forward to some feedback on uh, what kind of direction is needed. Um, that needs to happen, I think, as quickly as practically possible in terms of the actual uh, legwork to survey the departments and then the work of this council to consider those changes. Uh, I thank everyone who came out to speak on uh, the uh, proposal to waive our naming policy for parks. Uh, I wholeheartedly support uh, waiving that policy for both individuals who are named, but in particular, Councilor Ortiz, uh, who is the reason I, and, and in large part that I'm sitting in this seat and um, feel very honored to be uh, here trying my best to carry on some of the good work that she did for our community. 
And then uh, to the folks who came to speak about their concern of us banning the feeding of feral cats, we have just had one work session on uh, which was ostensibly to talk about how to control uh, wild turkey and deal with the rat issue. Feral cats were mentioned uh, during that work session because they are a nuisance in some parts of the city, but we didn't draft any specific language that addresses them. Personally, I'm not interested in banning the feeding of feral cats and would be very interested in finding ways that the city could work with the current groups that are doing the trap, trap neuter release, which I uh, believe is as effective as it's being presented, and that we could enhance the effectiveness of that work, and that might get at some of the issues um, that people have with feral cats in their neighborhood. So I really appreciate those of you who came to speak tonight on that, and also who emailed us offering your expertise on that topic. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Evans. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and thank you everyone for <coughs> coming out tonight to speak on various topics. Um, one issue that I want to address is that uh, something that Carmen Rubina mentioned, who's not uh, no longer here uh, uh, this evening, but 21 years ago, um, ICE made uh, raids in our community, and I was coaching. Uh, a soccer team at Whitaker School and very often I would go and pick up those kids, a lot of those kids, to take them to games and practices and it really is a striking thing when you go to pick a child up and their parents aren't there anymore because they've been taken away and deported and they're told not to answer the door, not to talk to strangers, not to even talk to people that you know because of fear that they are going to be taken away as well. So I want to underscore the fact that um, this is real and we need to protect all of our community and all of our citizens whether they are documented or not, because separating children from their parents is not okay. And we need to protect people who have come to this community and are coming to our communities to work, to be safe, to educate and raise their children, and not to have their families torn apart. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Mayor. I would just say that to those who spoke and to the, <clears throat> my colleague will make, I think, this motion at a later time. I'm in favor of naming the parks as proposed. I'm not in favor of waiving the rules to do it. I am in favor of amending our process so that that outcome can be reached. So I hope we're going to have that conversation in a way that allows me to support that end. Thank you. Okay. Any other folks needing to comment? Thank you all very much. Thanks to all of the people who spoke. Always enlightening for all of us and inspiring that you take the time to, to come and tell us uh, about your passions and your concerns, so we appreciate that. And now, we will move on. We have a consent calendar. Councillor Semple, did you have something you wanted to pull from? I want to uh, pull the tentative agenda. Tentative agenda, okay. Okay. Um, so, any other comments on the consent calendar? Move to approve the items on the consent calendar. I can, I can, Except for item B. item B. It's no longer on the consent calendar. Gotcha. It was pulled. Okay. Just being clear. All right. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. That is great. Uh, want to discuss item B? I just wanted uh, to, to bring attention to it because of the dog ban topic. Uh, the first time it was, I knew of scheduled was Thursday when packets came out. It's a controversial topic, as we all remember from last year. Uh, we knew it would probably come back, but not exactly when. And I, I don't think it's okay because it's not enough time for people to respond. And uh, 
I know that the people say it worked and I can see ways in which it did, but we have people downtown and we have another group and they don't all have the same resources to know that something's happening in four days. Um, we did not approve the tentative agenda before the meeting, which unfortunately we didn't even get to the ban, but um, I, I'm just concerned about the way the agenda uh, rolled out this time. And uh, that's all. Maybe we'll have Animal Wednesday. Okay, we'll have Animal Wednesday, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Mayor, if I may add, yes. one of our intent is to add the um, dog licensing as the first item on Wednesday um, to continue to follow through with that discussion and give council a chance to give some direction. And any direction that re resulted in some sort of an ordinance change would require a public hearing. And so there'd be additional time for people to give comment and provide feedback to. So just. I regardless don't think it's the way to do things. So we could have scheduled it before break. We knew it was coming. So maybe in the future we could do that. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, uh, item C. You need a motion. Oh, we need a motion to approve the yes, tentative agenda. Sorry. Move to approve item B. Oh, second. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven, six. Are you no. voting in favor? Okay, so six, uh, all opposed? Two. Okay. I didn't But it passes. Gotcha. Okay, now we're on to C. Uh, approval of neighborhood matching grants for fiscal year 2018. You want to just put that motion on the table? I didn't recognize those were pulled. I'm sorry. I uh, moved to... Oh, that wasn't pulled. I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong place. We're on. We did that. That was. We did that. Uh, we're on three on the A roof. Resolution to support the establishment Shall of I an read A the roof. Motion? Please. I move to approve the resolution to support the establishment of the Eugene A roof. Second. Discussion. I have Councilor Clark, Councilor Taylor, and Councilor Zelenka. Okay. City Attorney. I'm enough of a nerd to know the lemon test, and while I'm entirely in favor of the idea of this, um, the establishment clause, this is the establishment of an air roof. I don't understand the secular purpose here. Could you maybe tell me that? So the city is not actually a establishing the air roof itself and um, uh, Jennifer's here and she can speak to that but you have to have something from the local government that enables the air roof to be established so the city itself um, has to take some action to allow it to occur um, the Supreme Court in Lemon versus Kurtzman said that there's a three-pronged test for avoiding entanglement in establishment clause cases. The first leg being that the law needs, a, and in this case a resolution, needs a specific secular purpose. And I'm asking if you can tell me what that is. Yeah, but I'm, I wouldn't necessarily say the lemon test applies in this manner, in the manner in which you're applying it. Okay, um, how come? So, because where the the purpose of what the resolution is in front of you um, is not, so if we take a look at what it's doing, um, it grants the rights to exercise their religious freely by being able to enable them to establish their ear roof. So it is not the- It's granting the rights like we might rent or, or charge a, a, a right of way for Comcast to have its its utility lines underground in a similar way, yes. It's but it's symbolic. Okay. So and Comcast isn't symbolic. They're actually <laughs> running their stuff through our right, right way. This is this is symbolic. It's not actually. It doesn't become preclusive. As as the rabbi spoke to when he was here, it doesn't exclude anybody else from. 
um, using the area. It's a, it's something that's symbolic, and 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 the way that the the Jewish law is written is it requires some action from um, a local government to enable them to establish this. And you have um, many, many of these established by many. That's the part where I was just trying to understand, since it's been done so many times, help me understand how that doesn't violate. I, I can tell you, I, have n I did not sit down. I, I know exactly what the lemon test is. We you study that in law school. And um, I, because we are not taking any action to actually establish this versus enabling them to by taking this action, did I sit down and do a lemon test analysis? No, because I didn't see it yeah, I'm necessitating that. I'm happy to do that and provide that to you if that's something that the council desires. Um, but I did not conduct that, do um, research to determine whether it violated the establishment cause because on its face, it didn't, it doesn't do that. Um, but happy to provide that analysis if that's something you, that you're interested in. Maybe a later time. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilor Taylor. Thank you. I'll be delighted to vote for this. It's one time when we can do something that helps someone and doesn't hurt anyone and doesn't even cost us money. It's, it is, we're just... Make a buck. You make a in, buck. Oh, yeah, we're just Thank enabling you. people to do something within their religion which gives them freedom to do a number of things that they can't do otherwise. And I think it's a great thing to do, and it feels better than most things we do. Because because it it's I, I don't see how it could be controversial at all. It doesn't nobody has to give up anything or give anything. And some people will be able to do on the Sabbath some things they couldn't do otherwise. Thank you. Councilor Zelenka. Yeah, I too uh, met with uh, Rabbi Jacob Siegel and he explained to me what this was and why it was important to parts of the Jewish community. Uh, I left it up to the city attorney and and uh, and the capable hands of Rabbi Siegel to figure out how to make it work. Um, in in order for Eugene to be a safe and welcoming city with religious freedom, um, I think this is an important thing to do. It does not restrict or affect any other citizens' rights. But so I sort so I would be glad to support this and establish an A-Roof for the Jewish community in Eugene. Okay, any other comments? Councilor Pryor. Yeah, when I first had the conversation about this, I did a little Googling naturally, and um, had determined that when this was um, in conversation in Miami, there had been some questions asked whether or not this represented an establishment of religion or an endorsement of religion. And after the debate, they determined that it was actually just a reasonable accommodation, um, and that you didn't actually have to have permission from the city as a matter of fact, but as a matter of the way the Jewish law is written, you needed the uh, support of the local government in order to do it. So. Um, that's where they were able to say it's not the city government establishing a religion or actually endorsing a religion. It's simply a reasonable accommodation um, uh, within that context. And so in Miami, they went ahead and put it in because they were able to work that out. But the question's been asked before, and it didn't seem to create a problem. Okay. <clears throat> we ready for a vote on this? All in favor? One, two, three... Four, five, six, seven, eight. Excellent. That passes. Congratulations. That is excellent. Okay. Uh, I now am closing out of a city council meeting and opening an urban renewal agency to discuss an appointment. Hey there, my name is Ali Camp. I work in the Community Development Department. Um, I am here to present to you um, an appointment. We're asking the agency board to take action to appoint the mayor's recommendation to the ERP. The ERP is the Expenditure Review Panel. Council added the ERP to the existing oversight system for the Downtown Urban Renewal Plan with the 2010 plan amendment. The agency board carried forward this additional oversight with the 2016 plan amendment. The panel's purpose is to annu annually assess whether tax increment funds were spent on projects authorized by the plan and to report to the agency director. The panel had a vacancy after a member relocated. 
this member represented the work business perspective for the downtown. One application was received during the application time period. The mayor nominated Claire Barnum to fill the vacancy. Ms. Barnum serves as the executive director of the downtown Eugene Inc. and will provide the perspective of downtown property owners to the panel. And I'm here for questions if you guys have any. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's have a motion. I move to appoint the mayor's nomination of Ms. Claire Barnum to the expenditure review panel. I second it. Any discussion, questions? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That passes, thank you very much. Excellent. And now we close out of the renewal agency and reopen our council work session to discuss uh, initiation of a land use code change related to the 5th Street Market District expansion. Hello, Uh, my name is Will Dowdy. I'm in uh, community development. And thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about the 5th Street uh, Market District expansion. We have some slides that are nearly there. But if you recall, before your break, you heard about the uh, the proposed expansion of the market district. And um, at the time, we talked about three areas where the um, the project uh, um, comes into opportunities to partner with the city. There's um, code amendments, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. There's an alley vacation, um, which is another thing that requires city council uh, a decision. And then the third piece is um, a MUPTI um, the, the, the developers have said that they're going to um, go forward with the MUPTI application. We have not received that yet, and we have not received the alley vacation uh, um, application yet at this time. So those are both uh, forthcoming, but we expect that they'll be on their way. So um, what we're talking about with the, uh, the, the code amendments are, are two things. Um, there's a, a, height, a building height issue, and then there's an issue with the rooftop sign. And so, um, so it's those two areas, and there's slightly different paths that we want to, um, we, we think it's prudent to take on those two uh, areas. And so this would enable the development to be built as it was presented, um, as it's envisioned. Um, and so, uh, do we have, is it? Oh, there it comes. Sort of. We do have packets. Please stand by. Okay, so uh, slide two. <laughs> um, like just the, those are the two parts that I, two parts that I mentioned, and then um, and then I'll, at the end I'll talk about the next steps, the public process that that follows on that. So at the top we just have a pretty, pretty picture. Um, this is the, the picture that you've seen before um, showing the, the three buildings that are proposed as part of the, um, of the, the market district expansion. Um, and the, the height issue is with the two taller buildings, so that shouldn't be a surprise. Um, and then the rooftop sign you can see on the left side of the screen, or the left side of the, the slide, um, and I'll come into that in more detail. So with the height, um, the, the, this property falls within the Skinner Butte height limitation area. And so, the next slide is a picture of the Skinner Butte. Um, and you can see that, uh, of course, we all know this location, we all know this site, we've all seen the views of it and the views from it, and that's why the height limitation area is there, is to protect the views to and from uh, the Butte. And then there's a star to identify where this property is. The next picture is a, um, is a, a, a diagram of the uh, height limitation area. It goes all the way up to the river, all the way down to 6th Avenue, from Washington on the west to the uh, Coburg Road Viaduct on the east. And I've put three stars in there. The big orange star is the Market District, district Expansion. T- above that, you see Yapoa Terrace as a red star. And then additionally, there's a star on the, um, the Hilton Hotel and um, the Halt Center. And, I, and I'll come back to those as um, as a couple of properties just as a reference point to you. Um, they're buildings that we know and they're, they're heights that are, are uh, relevant. You'll see that the Hilton and the, um, the Halt Center fall outside of the height limitation area. Um, again, just making sure that you understand where you are. 
The next slide shows Sixth Avenue, which I said is that southern board, uh, boundary. There's the um, the star on the the site. There's um, I've just marked out where the Homes for Goods uh, project is next to it, and the Fifth Street Public Market. And now we get into the complicated diagrams. So I apologize for these, but I wanted to show you what the zoning um, the zoning in this area is. Um, the most of downtown is zoned in either the C2, which is um, uh, a the um, this is kind of a general commercial. I can't remember the, the specific uh, name for that. And then the C3, which is our most dense commercial zone, is in red. Um, and, that's, and that's really the core of downtown is zoned for C3. And what you'll see, um, and what I want to call your attention to, is that both C2 and C3 go north of 6th Avenue. And that's certainly... Um, uh, that's certainly how we experience that area, that, that this, um, the downtown density continues on both sides of, of 6th. But then, as I've called your attention to on the next slide, you'll see that the Skinner Butte height limitation does go down to 6th. So you've got one half block that's, um, that's kind of in the middle of the Venn diagram. It's, both, it's still in that C2, C3 zone, but it also falls within the height limitation area. And that's going to be important because C2 zone um, has 120 feet of height limit. Um, that's standard across the city, whether you're out on West 11th or you're downtown. C3 has 150 feet of height limit. So this brings us to the, the first of these section uh, slides. And uh, what you'll see is that I've, I've cut a slice through the city. Um, you can see the, the butte rising there at uh, 682 feet up on the right. And then most of downtown is in this 420, 422 range. Um, and uh, so you can see that slope. And, and uh, on the left, I've put two, but, okay. uh, two dashed lines that indicate the height limits um, in the C2 and C3 zones. And then this blue line shows what the requirements are in the uh, Skinner Butte height limitation area. Just to make things a little bit more complicated for you, the way that we wrote the Skinner Butte height limitation uh, requirement is that you can go up to 500 feet above sea level. So everything else is measured from grade. Everywhere else in the city, um, building heights are measured from the grade, except in this one area around the Butte where we, um, because what we're taking into account is a, nat um, a natural landscape feature, the, um, the decision was said, well, let's make a 500 foot cap and nothing on a building can go above 500 feet unless you're, you, you still get to go 40 feet as minimum. And so then you get this kind of funny line, which is 500 feet above sea level or 40 feet, whichever is greater. <laughs> so hopefully you're not completely confused. When was, that? When was this written? <laughs> Before my time. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the Fifth Street Public Market site, um, the the grade there, as I said, it's about 422. So they have an effective 78 to 80 foot height limit. If there wasn't a height limitation area imposed on that on that property or on the properties around them, it would be 120 feet for that property. And farther to the west, you'd get spots where it's up to 150 feet, which is almost double what the um, what the requirement is now. So I've dropped a couple of buildings in on the bottom of that page. This is the bottom of page five, and you can see that the Hilton uh, Hotel. On the south side of six, so outside of the height limitation area, is, is almost exactly 150 feet. Then you can see the Yapoa Terrace, it's 212 feet. It's actually almost as tall from the top of that as the Butte itself. You also will see how much closer the Yapoa Terrace is to the, the Butte. Um, so that increased height of the, the building and also its uh, closeness to the, the summit of the Butte is part of why it's so much more noticeable than, say, the Hilton and the, um, the Flybox and the Hull Center. So zooming in a little bit, you see the Hilton Hotel. And then on the bottom, you see the proposed development. This is the bottom of page six. And you can see that the proposed development, as I started all this off with, exceeds the 500 foot um, height limit as designed. And so that's, that's the problem. And that's, the, uh, that's at the core of this request. It's can we find a way to, um, to make this possible for this site. And then finally, the last of these section cuts shows, the, um, shows the, the full picture from um, all the way from 7th up to the top of the Butte. And you can see how the proposed development fits in, um, kind of nestles below the, the height of the Hilton, and it's uh, quite different uh, from Yapoa Terrace. So I've talked with, um, with uh, planning staff about this, 
And the recommendation that we came up with is that the whole half block along the bottom of the um, Skinner Butte height limitation area, the whole, um, and it's really this piece that's both in the C2 or C3 zone and in the height limitation area, that, that instead of having the full limit that we step down, we, it's kind of a transition zone, um, and so we called it a tiered approach, that the, um, the southern bit of the, height, of the Skinner Butte height limitation zone not have the full, uh, the full, um, full limit that the rest of the area does, but it becomes kind of a, a gradual transition from the heights of downtown as you get to the more limiting area around the Butte. And so that's really all that is there at the bottom. So what would this mean? Um, there's a couple of diagrams. Uh, this is the top of page eight. Um, so the, uh, instead of having 120 feet um, on these properties, right now they're brought down to about 78 feet, as I've said, and so a building as being proposed um, exceeds that. What we're suggesting is that, um, is that we create this intermediate zone. So it goes from 120 feet in the uh, C2, 100, or 150 in C3. Then these properties would have a, um, uh, we would write something in new that says it's 530 feet to the top of the building. And then once you get north of that half block, it would be a 500 foot, um, it would be a 500 foot uh, or 40 feet, whichever is greater standard as, it, uh, as we have today. And so this would be a way to, um, to kind of continue the urban character of 6th Avenue. Um, it'd be a way to create an opportunity for a little bit more density um, within the downtown core uh, you know, in a place where it's, um, it would fold in quite nicely to its context, and it doesn't really uh, have an impact on the Butte. To do that, or to, to figure out that last piece, uh, I've got some breathtaking uh, panoramic shots, um, <laughs> which you can see. It reproduced here at about four inches wide. Um, these are taken from Google uh, Google Maps, but I, I, it's actually surprisingly hard to find views of the Butte, um, at least from the south. Uh, some nice uh, look at uh, vistas from the north. But so I, I took a shot from the uh, the Ferry Street Bridge. Well, I realized that I'm actually north of the blocks in question. So then that. Um, the uh, any development that would happen there, regardless of what the height would be, is outside of your direct line of sight to the butte, so it would not impact the butte. Okay. Then I went to um, here's a shot on Willamette Street from the downtown core, and even if this picture were 20 times bigger, you actually can't see the butte from um, from this spot on Willamette on the 800 block of Willamette. So development wouldn't change that. Um, and so then I went a little bit closer, and so this is on Sixth Avenue um, at Willamette. <clears throat> and what you can see is that right in the middle, there's a little view of the um, little view of the butte. So you can see the butte from this spot, um, but it just so happens that on the street, nothing is going to be built. So your view along the street will continue, and um, this this view would change significantly if you built an 80 foot building or a 78 foot building. It would also change significantly if you built a, a slightly taller building than that. But um, but none of them will actually impact your views of the butte. And then I uh, found a, a view from the Butte itself, because the, the original ordinance was there to protect views to and from the, the Butte. And um, there's these little green arrows on there. Um, these represent approximately the height that the building would come to if, if it was built anywhere along this area. And you would see that although buildings um, build up to the 530 foot mark would be visible, as would buildings built under the existing code, none of them are going to significantly alter the, the view from the top. So that was the, um, the findings there. I'll, I'll go a little bit more quickly with the sign standards. Um, the, uh, basically, our, our sign standards are, are, um, are, are, uh, are pretty restrictive about rooftop signs. And so um, there's, uh, th there's a few different places where the, the uh, signs that's proposed would be, um, would, would be in conflict. I talked with our, our land use analysts, and they said that um, a, a, a code change, uh, anything that would be broadly applicable across the community, could have lots of unintended consequences that they weren't prepared to, um, 
they weren't they, they didn't know exactly what was going to happen. So they recommended that we do something that's um, that's different. It's an uncodified ordinance. Um, this is a tool that's sometimes used with historic properties. Um, basically, we write uh, specific code um, or a specific. Uh, ordinance that limits the development um, in this way, and so this would be a, a tool to use to say that this sign would have to function within these parameters, but nothing else in the code changes. Um, and so that was uh, their recommendation on that. Mm. Fast forward to the last of the slides. Um, what I'm here asking you to do, um, our recommended motion, um, is that we would go forward, you would initiate this process, um, and the final decisions would be made much later. Um, initiating a, um, these ordinances would go through, we would do the written notice to the DLCD. There would be a, a planning commission process with public notices, public hearing, planning commission would make a recommendation. It would come back to you for another public hearing, and then the final action. So we see this as a um, as a, a kickoff point, and despite all the detail that I went through, this um, we don't have all the details, and so um, so we'd be developing that for the the the, um, the motion or the for the ordinance that you would then be able to review at a later time. So, any questions? Okay, thank you. I have Councillor Clark, Councillor Syret. Anybody else in the queue? Okay. Would you like me to begin by reading the motion? Sure. I will do exactly that. I move to initiate a land use code amendment creating a tiered height limit in the Skinner Butte height limitation area and move to initiate an uncodified land use code amendment waiving height requirements for roof signs on the proposed Gordon Hotel site. Second. And okay. I'll speak and to, speak it. to it, Thank please. you very much. An uncodified ordinance. Okay. City Attorney, help. <laughs> uncodified ordinance. You don't want me to apply the lemon test to this. Nope. <laughs> nope. Just checking. Does, there's a particular secular yes. purpose here that even I can see. <laughs> anyway, um, ha, could you help me understand that as a form of, 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 of law for our city? Certainly. Um, so an uncodified ordinance has the exact same rule of law that a codified ordinance does. Um, what a codified ordinance means, you go to our city code and you find it in there. Right. Um, we have a very, we have a, we have a handful of uncodified ordinances that have just as much rule of law. Your rest stop ordinances live in that world. Um, they're not codified. They start. It started out as a pilot. It wasn't codified. You're not. You can't go to Chapter Four and find the rest stop code provisions. But they, nevertheless, they were adopted by ordinance. You have the exact same charter requirements that apply to an uncodified ordinance that you do with an ordinance that adopts code provisions. Um, and so, uh, in this case, it's it's my understanding that planning is recommending um, an uncodified ordinance here because it's such a discreet right. um, provision that applies. To a specific thing, so that's going to apply to one circumstance of a particular, normally a, uh, occurring ordinance or code piece, mm -hmm. right? It could be you could have it codified. So the example of taking something, amend that, the whole thing, and get into the whole thing. Right, Edison Parking, which is a um, is something that you initiated a couple months ago, uh, that is being processed as a codified ordinance, even right. though it is a quasi judicial decision that's being made for a very specific piece of property. Could we have an uncodified ordinance for, let's say, a park naming? Yes. Hmm. You Interesting. Could. Okay. Um, Thank you. That's my question. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I just backed into a weird yeah. answer. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Yeah, yes. Work. Uh, Councilor Syret. Thank you. Um, well, I support the city manager's recommendation in this case. I appreciate the uh, detail provided by staff and that very illustrative briefing. Uh, it's, a, it's a shame folks at home weren't able to see it um, because it's actually very helpful in seeing how the impact of these proposed changes, how they would play out, and demonstrating that they won't really result in disrupting the view shed, which is the purpose of our ordinance. Um, and in fact, I think we have an opportunity to enhance the look of downtown by providing the um, code changes and the uncodified ordinance um, 
that's recommended here and allow this project to go forward as envisioned. So thank you. Councilor Zelenka. Uh, my question's about the uh, Skinner Butte height limitation area and the history of it. Why, why was that put in place and when? I have um, an ordinance from 1991, um, and it's, it says that it's, it's for the purpose of protecting the views to and from. Um, my assumption is that it would have something to do with the Apollo Terrace, but I don't have any, uh, yeah, any findings or any, anything else that would... Uh, uh, I was here, but I don't remember that. But the Apollo Terrace was built way before that. Before that yeah. um, I suspect it's to protect the view shed. Uh, I, I guess... One of the issues with this is that it, these buildings are substantially lower than the Hilton, um, which you've shown in your beautifully illustrated graphs, um, which I think thought you had these because we would have been totally confused. Um, and uh, so uh, I, 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 uh, I agree with Councilor Syrett that this is not a problem um, and uh, I think it's a clever solution to it. So does the, uh, the other question, and does the Hacksaw Home for Good building have the same problem, or is it lower? The, the current design is lower, so it wouldn't be an impact, but the, the idea with this is that it would enable that whole, that whole strip from Washington to Coburg along that um, facing sixth right. to take advantage of this. So the other clarifying point, so the only place in the whole city that this 500 feet above sea level elevation is, is in this little area right in front of the butte. Mm -hmm. Every place else in the city that's C2 is 120 feet. Right. And these aren't even close. These are right. 78 feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, so this motion just is, is initiation of these things. I still remain skeptical about the Mufti, and that, but this doesn't have anything to do with that. Councilor Pryor. Yeah, no, I'm fully supportive of this uh, elegant, I would say is the word I would use, solution to the, to the issue. Um, but I'm just, I guess, saying I'm mindful that in the future we may have this same conversation again because as the community grows and as time passes, this, this may come again. So I realize we're doing an uncodified solution around a specific piece of property, but we may at some point want to have a larger conversation about dealing with this in a more codified way so that we have that clarity and consistency as we begin to develop. Okay, I believe we have a motion that's seconded. Everybody ready to vote? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a very entertaining final act for this uh, meeting, and we are adjourned.